best of the Dan the Batard Show with Stu Goss. The best of Mike Sure. How to be perfect. With Mike Sure, creator of The Good Place in Parks and Rec. I want to encourage the audience and the people who support us to support the new book, How to Be Perfect. The correct answer to every moral question is available today. Mike Sure is joining us. He's written the book, and I don't mean to be paternal, and I'm sorry if it sounds this way, but I am legitimately proud that this man with so much going on in his life decided to tackle this project because the pandemic and some of the selfishness in the world bothered him so much that he decided to write a book about every philosopher throughout time, how they would answer every question. It's a philosophy book. It's a degree of difficulty book. It's got comedy in it. And I encourage you to buy it because it's available today. He also does for Metal Arc Media, the podcast with Joe Posnanski, and it's great. It's They're fun and they're smart and their sports analysis is excellent when they deign to talk about sports, which isn't all that often. So I want you to support what it is Mike's doing because I'm telling you that this project of his was a big tackle. How's the reception gone so far, Mike? And thank you. We've got a lot of different things we want to do with you here, including something wonderful for Stugat. But uh, how is the project going with the book and how is it being received? First of all, thank you, Dad. That was very nice of you to say that you're proud of me. Um, it's going well. I mean, I don't know. We'll see in a, in a week or so, uh, I guess if people bought it and liked it, but, um, it was a labor of love. It came out of making the show, the good place and thinking about this stuff and talking about it with some very smart and funny people for the better part of six years. And it was sort of, I, it was sort of like my exit interview from, from writing that show. It was like, here's everything I learned and I'm going to try to present it in a way that people can actually enjoy instead of the act, the original philosophy books, which are usually dense and opaque and unreadable. So uh, I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm happy that I did it. It was not easy to do, although it did give me something to, to focus on during the uh, pandemic when I was locked in my house. But you say labor of love. It was also a labor born of fear and horror, correct? You're decent about these <laughs> things, but you, what is happening in this country is like you don't get more appalled than you get when you worry about the threats to democracy all around us. That's true. Although I, I started writing it before the pandemic, before a lot of this stuff had happened. So it was a, it was a combo platter. It was like, I think this stuff is really important every day. And then also recently, especially in this country, some things have happened that have made it even more important. I tried not to make the book political or, or about the pandemic, although it would have been kind of easy to do that. It's really just about like looking around and trying to figure out maybe how we can all be like 1% better. It's a, it's the money ball approach to morality, I guess. It's like, let's just try to get like one or 2% better in a bunch of different arenas in our lives. And then that a rising tide will lift all boats. That's the basic idea. So leftist liberal hackery. That's right. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, we assume that for me, right? That's yeah, that's a given. Hollywood elite, uh, <laughs> Hollywood elitist, leftist, uh, yeah, socialist, uh, whatever. Sure, go ahead. Okay, so we're asking you to support the people who support us, and this uh, this podcast is climbing because it is a lot of fun, and and you know he has smart people around that he has fun with, and this guy. We like to have fun here. This guy is somebody who has been doing comedy for a generation of people across Saturday Night Live, Good Place, and you know Brooklyn Nine Nine, uh, Parks and Rec. So, with that as your introduction, Stu, guys, do you know what's coming up here? Because one of the best moments we've had in the last year is when Mike Shore, during Freedom, did a ripoff of you, a copycat, an homage of. Just Stugatz's weekend observation. It was incredible. I was honored. I have thanked Mike a couple of times via text, but I have no idea what's about to happen. Here. Mike, do you and want... And by the way, it was a Suey award-winning performance. Yes. Have, you know. Wow. <laughs> Congrats. Congratulations. That boy, yes. And so what do you want to tell <laughs> Stugatz? Because he does not know. We have teased him today saying we've got something delightful going on because that's as happy as I've seen him in a year when you were doing During Freedom... You, you one of a, a great comedy writer was basically doing a ripoff of Stu Gatz. It uh, he was joyous. Yes. Well, you know I'm a huge fan of the show, and I listen to it. Uh, I listen to some part of it essentially every day. I've been listening to it every day in the new year in 2022, and I have made some observations here in January. It is time for Mike sure. to share his game notes. No one in the media will tell you what happened better than my voice. Mike Sure. <laughs> January observations. 
is brought to you by DraftKings. Lost another 16 parlay and hoping to salvage your weekend by taking the under on Minnesota Boston College women's ice hockey? <laughs> Try DraftKings. <laughs> Dan! <laughs> After a solid thrashing. At the hands of the Alabama Crimson Tide, it looked like all was lost. But then came a thrilling national championship game where that defeat was avenged and a title was delivered to the Peach State for the first time in 40 years. And after that decisive victory, make no mistake about it, Mike Ryan's hair <laughs> he is back. <laughs> Hollywood supports me. Mike's hair. Mayor. Hey, Mike. <laughs> the excuses and explanations to get out of shaving your head when it's clear that you're supposed to shave your head. The endless appeals and explanations and filibusters that have gone on so long, we're all annoyed and kind of just want to let you win. Mike, the Stu Gotts is strong in you. You're playing both charge. <laughs> it's a heady play by you, my friend. No pun intended. The show would be better without Mike's mullet. <laughs> Business in the front. Disaster in the back. <laughs> Shave it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Never shave it, Mike. Why? Because bleep them, that's why. Hey, new Meadowlark Media drinking game. We all do a shot of tequila. Every time Dan Lebetard says the phrase, across decades, <laughs> we will all be dead by 11 a.m. Hey, Dan. You can just say for 20 years <laughs> or for the last 30 years. You've been using the phrase across decades. <laughs> across two decades. <laughs> Chris Cody, fired by ESPN, rehired by Dan, wondering where he fits in at Meadowlark Media. And all it took for him to find his place was to royally screw up an ad read. <laughs> so badly that the company had no choice but to lean in and embrace the futility. Sheets and giggles. Shiggles. Thorough incompetence. Thompidence. And yet, he is by far the more talented Cody. Oh, wow. What happened there? What happened? <laughs> Chris Whittingham. <laughs> Good morrow, my fine sir. <laughs> Prithee, didst thou see the Arsenal Liverpool fixture in the Carabao Cup semis? The Gunners had the run of play and were by a fair bit the better side. But the Liverpudlian swashbuckling attack proved too strong, and the Dioga Yoda brace proved the difference. You're British. That's what I'm saying. Twas and a British person. A person. Now, please don't tell Dan that we recently had a lengthy text exchange about international test cricket. <laughs> it's true. Witty. I recently listened to a local hour and heard David Sampson take a bold and brave stance in favor of coaches hitting their players on the head. <laughs> you rarely hear the pro side of that argument. So I salute you, David Sampson, for standing up for what you believe in, which in this case was that coaches should be allowed to hit their players on the head. You know what the I and David stands for, Dan? It stands for, I think it's fine when coaches hit their players on the head. David Sampson appearing in a documentary about Woody Hayes <laughs> collision course. That's right. I just dropped a Woody Hayes reference. <laughs> Cody loved it. I did. Because he's been the standard for coaches punching players on the head. Across decades. Across five decades. Yes. Right Great job by you. Jessica Smetana, the only person in the world 
whose top three sports interests are the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, and someone named Lewis Hamilton. <laughs> and before you tell me that Lewis Hamilton is actually the biggest sports star in the world, because actually Formula One actually is actually the biggest actual sport in the world. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Formula One. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Max Verstappen. <laughs> Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know what, Max Verstappen? Do it at the Aramco Grand Premio de España in Barcelona. <laughs> Guy was 15.84 seconds off the pace at the Aramco Grand Premio de España in Barcelona. Wants to call himself a champion? Please. <laughs> Verstappen couldn't even beat Valtteri Bottas at the Rolex Turkish Grand Prix in Istanbul. Max Verstappen? More like Max Keeps Stopping. You know what the V in Verstappen stands for, Dan? I do not. Very far behind Valtteri Bottas at the Rolex Turkish Grand Prix in Istanbul. Medi. Roy Bellamy. Uh-oh. How's it going, man? Doing good, Mike. Everything thanks. all right? Yeah. Everything yeah. all right? Yeah, everything's all right. You've been a little quiet recently. <laughs> and by recently, Across I mean decades. since 2007. Across decades, yeah. But here in January, you've been even quieter. Is it because the lightning are nipping at the ice cat's frosty paws <laughs> with the maple leaves right behind in third? It can be stressful. Being a fan of a sport that no one cares about. You're right. I, I should know. I watch baseball. <laughs> Speaking of which, Billy Gill. Uh-oh. Pitchers and catchers report in like two weeks. Maybe. Assuming there is a baseball season. <laughs> which there definitely might not be. You know what the B in baseball stands for, Dan? I do not. It stands for bleeping it up. Yeah. As in the owners are really bleeping this up. They always are. <laughs> Billy, don't worry about baseball being canceled. It's only about nine more months before you can go back to hosting a podcast featuring Jabba Chamberlain <laughs> and one of the lesser Gronkowski brothers. <laughs> Every morning in my podcast feed... I get somewhere around 60 new podcasts from you guys. The Local Hour. The Big Suey. South Beach Sessions. The Podcast with Joe Posnanski and Michael Schur. The Shirt. Post Game Show. I'm getting there. The Post Game Show. <laughs> Cinephile. Montgomery and Company. Off the Looking Glass. Something called the podcast with Joe Posnanski. <laughs> Drunk Amin El Hassan talking about basketball. <laughs> you know what the W in Meadowlark stands for, Dan? I do not. It stands for way too many goddamn podcasts. <laughs> so true. DraftKings gave you $50 million. That's about $8 per podcast you put out. I know content is king, but slow the hell down. Speaking of hell, Art Bryles. Dan? Those are the January. Yes. Excellent. Amazing. Uh, amazing. Thank you. Amazing. Uh, as good amazing. As the amazing. Amazing. Ever. amazing. That's hard to do. That's I don't know whether you feel pressure or expectations on the stuff that you do because it is hard to continually meet those expectations. Mike Schur's top five actors that will steal your wife. Top five actors who you're worried you, that if you leave them with your wife, your wife will leave you. you need to look out now. Number five, John Ham. Hambone. Did you see him last night at the uh, at the All Star game? Still, I mean, looks amazing. Steaming, the guy's the, crazy, per perfect, and and just and very masculine. Number four, Timothy Oliphant. Thought you were gonna go with Chalamet. No, Chalamet's Chalamet's. Um, you're uh, showing your age, be, Mike. Be, a be beautiful person. No, of course I'm. I'm. I'm doing this based on my, my, my wife. I'm worried about my wife. 
Uh, <laughs> Chalamet's a beautiful person, but he's he's less threatening to me because he's uh, he's made out of fine china. He weighs 110 pounds, and uh, you know that's less threatening to me. Um, Oliphant, though, cowboy, rugged, handsome, perfectly symmetrical face. Uh, he's got it all. Uh, all right, number three, uh, I'll say uh, Manny Jacinto. <laughs> Manny Jacinto played played uh, uh, with Jason Mendoza on The Good Place. I don't know if you've ever seen what he looks like, but it's not. He's not, I don't think he's a human being. He's like, he was sent from outer space to be attractive. At any point, as, as you write a book about uh, people making principal decisions in all circumstances, using life's uh, and history's philosophers to choose... Uh, is this person, Manny Jacinto, uh, somebody who could actually lure your wife, or are you now realizing that you need to make your uh, list a bit diverse here because otherwise it's just going to be everyone looks like John Hamm? Go look at go look at pictures of Manny Jacinto on the internet and tell me that you wouldn't be worried that your wife would run away. I'm with not him. saying he's he, not beautiful. I'm just a, asking you if you have considered before making your list. I can't have five John Hams. No, not everybody is as cynical as you are, Dan. You know, some pe some some people don't uh, don't make everything a calculation. Number two, just, <laughs> number two, uh, it's Christmas. <laughs> Yeah, that's a fine, and that's number, fine and number one actually number two is to tie it's Christmas and Idris Elba <laughs> great shout yeah he is, he's you. beautiful number one I find, I find his Definitely accent to be so mysterious because it's, it's 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 South London Cockney but it's also like uh, it's, it's there's also like some some other hints in there I don't know I don't I can't really put my finger on it doesn't sound like Ian Wright he sounds like Idris Elba his accent is um, the technical uh, lexicographical term for it is handsome. He speaks, he speaks handsome. <laughs> he speaks handsomely, handsome. yeah. 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 <laughs> Put it on the poll, please, at Levitard Show. Does Elba speak handsome? Number one. <laughs> Matthew Reese. I need Google image this guy. I have no idea what he looks like. He looks Here's like a thing. KGB if, spy if, that you would let spy on your country because you couldn't tell him no. <laughs> That's right. If you if you Google him, you you want your first instinct will not be oh this guy is as handsome as Idris Elba or Timothy Oliphant, but um but watch the Americans or anything he's ever been in. He does some wild shit in that show too that you're just yeah. like wow well, they gotta, really went there on TV. Gotta be honest, they? I'm not seeing it, lads. I'm not. I'm, I'm not, telling I'm you, not seeing it does, with you can't. Reese. It doesn't. It, it's not about the He's photograph. A it's a. It's about the. It's about the performing. The WGA strike explained. Wow, Cody gets a haircut. Mike, sure, you are looking at what's happening over my right shoulder, and you are thinking what we have pointed out that he looks like Colonel Jessup. <laughs> I'm getting Joe Pesci. Is anyone else getting Joe Pesci? Huh. That's not what mm. you want to go for there, right, Greg Cody? Joe Pesci would be bad, correct? We don't want Joe Pesci, do we? We want Colonel Jessup. Yeah, I prefer Colonel Jessup. Absolutely, yeah. You do? You do? Thank you. A, mur yeah. a murderous military lunatic? Well, Nothing just wrong the with looks. that. Right, yeah. When you say Joe Pesci, are you talking like The Irishman or are you oh, talking yeah, about Goodfellas? Pesci, Which movie are you talking I'm about? I'm talking about Goodfellas. I'm talking about like our Home Alone Joe Pesci. It's like the, the slicked back hair. Yeah. All right, go know, ahead. And the, uh, video, please find that and put that in a corner as well to see if mm. that is worthy of what Mike Schur is saying because I we really did think he looked like Colonel Jessup. He looks better indisputably. Uh, Mike, thank you for making time for us. We have you interning on Stat of the Day. We've got Adam McKay interning on Horrifying Climate Fact of the Day. Uh, you also are in the middle of a giant fight, and it seems like an, a, a fight for our time, a fight for history. You're right in the front of it, and it seems like Bill Maher, Andrew Barrymore, were forced to not break from the unity of your union, uh, they were for Bill Maher is hard to push back on this stuff, but it seems like he realized the error of his ways and not being unified here. Um, where are you on this today as we speak? Because I just found out that winning time was canceled. And I'm like, how much more of our content are we going to lose before this starts really hurting customers who care about well-made things? I'm sorry, I can't focus on anything you're saying. I'm just mesmerized <laughs> by the haircut that's happening behind you. Thank you. It's not a, I mean, it's not nothing you're doing. Uh, anyway. 
I wouldn't. I would like to think they weren't forced. Um, I would prefer to think of it as they thought it over and realized that it maybe was a better decision to not go back to work. But uh, you know, whatever the reason is, I'm glad they did it. I think the the thing that they have in common is that I think they've been in the business for a long time and they're able to see which way the wind is blowing to some degree. And they, you know, got pushback from members of various unions and guilds and changed their minds. I mean, I, I'm, I tend to think, and maybe this is my own bias, but I tend to think that maybe Drew Barrymore's decision was more based in, um, you know, empathy and that Bill's was a little more cynical. You know, there were some, some rumors that he had a hard time booking guests. I don't know if that's true. I certainly know that there are a lot of folks who don't want to cross picket lines right now. Um, and maybe, uh, you know, just because he's sort of by nature a contrarian, I, I think it probably hurt him more to back off. Um, but I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, what they, they both made the right decision. I'm glad they did it. And I hope that other folks who were tempted to sort of, you know, make a move in that direction will think twice about it now just because they, not because of fear, but because simply that it's the right thing to do really for, in, uh, for the union fights that we're all in. Thank you for correcting my language on that. Uh, Lucas, let me uh, warn you, because I saw the fear as you got near the jugular with sharp things on shaving. I saw the fear of Chris Cody's face, producer of our show and son to a loving father, who was worried about how sensitive uh, his father's <laughs> skin is. And if you do he not, bleeds, Dan. Yeah, and if you do not know that information, Lucas, whatever business we just got you moments ago, will be harmed by you taking on the task of giving that man a shave with his sensitive skin if you cut him and he bleeds easily. I'm also wondering if he has the sanitizing stick or is he going to have, like, the alcohol spray? All right. Are you getting a shave as well, Greg He's Cody? shaving his neck. Uh, are, okay. Apparently I am. This is luxurious. That's part of the haircut. It's just, he's just cleaning up. Okay. He's finishing up. All right. I just want to make sure there's not a sharp, sharp razor. Chris was worried that his father's going to start bleeding on television. <laughs> there's a lot of loose skin in his neck, too. Right. Like, yeah. Oh, geez. I have a turkey neck. <laughs> but cleaning up is around the hair, like in the head. He's cleaning up his chest. I mean, it's Luke like... is a professional with a straight razor. <laughs> You never gotten a haircut? That's I have. They go, they get around a little under Not the shirt. Not that far down, no. Come they on. Do. Under the shirt. A little under bit. The like shirt. Like no. the, I think you need to talk to someone. Top buddy. of your back. <laughs> Angel, can you please make a t-shirt that just exclaims, I have a turkey neck, which is what Greg Cody just shouted <laughs> from behind me moments ago. Uh, Mike, but I do appreciate that you changed the wording on my verb because it wasn't forces. Can you move the microphone a little further away from the razor, Dad? Thank you. I would say closer. Move it closer. <laughs> okay, or closer. Yeah, it keeps getting yeah. louder. Which uh, Roy, oh my God. <laughs> Roy, this is what's funniest about what's happening now. Roy has found nothing funnier over the first three hours of this than how much louder the razor keeps getting behind me. Oh my God! Because Roy only listens to the show for how it sounds. It's funny each time how loud that gets. But Jesus Christ. you corrected me on the language, Mike, because you have been very gentle with your language and people will find it off-putting no matter how right a group is if a group is forcing through pressure people like bill maher and drew barrymore who may be freedom fighters to some who don't believe in the labor cause they they are being forced into unity you wrote a book about this mike uh, how selfish people are they wouldn't wear masks for each other when it was the simplest thing at the start of the pandemic you went through all of history's philosophers looking for the answer of why people can't do simple things for each other they end up being on the right side of this because you're on the right side of this but they're pushed by peer pressure and some people don't like that yeah no one likes to be peer pressured um, but sometimes it can be good. Sometimes it could be a force for good. I think a, a, a very light public shaming, I think has a place in society because if there's no people who have no sense of shame, have no sense of disgrace. And, and I don't know to what degree that was a factor here. And I, and I don't, I, I don't want to ascribe motive to people because I don't know either of them, but I do think that, um, they, they made a decision. If you want to be generous uh, and empathetic, you might say that they made that decision because they genuinely feel for the crews of the shows that, uh, they, that uh, they work on and that they 
feel that pressure of folks being out of work? And I guess the answer that they got and the answer they should get is like, yeah, we all feel that. We all feel this tremendous sense of responsibility for everyone who works on the shows that we make and the movies we make. And also, you know, there's ancillary folks out there who work in restaurants that are supported by studios and people, you know, buying lunch and dinner from, you know, restaurants that are near the places we work. And the, recently, the I think the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, estimated that it's a $5 billion hit to the economy of California to have a strike go on for as long as it's gone on. So, I, you know, I, I don't think it's false to say that there were good reasons in their brains to think, well, yeah, we should go back to work. It's just you have to think of it in the larger context here, right? It's like the if we don't win this fight, if sag after doesn't win their fight, then the long-term damage that's done is much greater than the short-term damage that's being done right now. So I, I want to believe that they had good intentions and I want to believe that they did the right thing for the right reasons. I hope I'm right. Um, also, how much does this haircut cost? If it's the free. old one, yeah. the, this is a free, well, how much would it cost normally? $10. No, no. Your Tony, he said, no, no, that's what he paid for Tony. $40. It, right. This is probably more than that. $40 and up is what this would normally go for. Uh, but Mike, I mean, worth every penny. Uh, yeah, well, he looks great and we will, uh, unveil all of this and see how he feels about it in, uh, in a little bit. But you said before getting to stat of the day, you texted me last night, I have an impersonation for you and you wouldn't give me yeah. any more information. Exciting. I've been working on I've been working on an impression. You want to hear my impression? Do I? I don't know. My it's an impression of every Dolphins fan every time Tua drops back to pass. Ready? <laughs> Here we go. Uh, oh God. Oh no. No, no, no. God, I, throw it. Throw it. Throw it. Throw it. Throw it. That's my impression. Chris Cody giving That's you a true. sour face. That's just not true. Chris, <laughs> Chris Cody it is. has confidence. Yes, it is. Now, when I see a Listen. defensive end that gets around the tackle, then right. I do that. Yeah. Mm. Oh, God. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Get, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. That's, your, that's the impression. All right. Maybe and uh, like, you, you guys have built this incredible offensive machine, this incredibly complex, intricate, well-oiled it's Ferrari so of an what, offense. Mike, what you're saying it's, is so great. It's, so it's great. held together. Yes. The on-off switch is yes. being held in place by a single right. human hair, yes. and you all know it. Mike sure tries to break the Look at Me Louie record. We revealed to him that Augusta has caved, and now they are allowing uh, players on, on the Live Tour, Mike, to, to play at Augusta, which was really the last bit of leverage the PGA Tour had over their golfers. Yeah, I mean, eventually they'll just be the only game in town, right? That's the goal. The goal is just buy everybody out. You know what this reminds me of, actually? Can I tell you a brief story? Yeah. So I was having this discussion with Bill Simmons, who's a good friend of mine. Lives oh, in my <laughs> Sports guy. So Bill and I were thinking about like times in history when major sports leagues kind of went off the rails, right? And he was like, you know what this reminds me of? And then he told me that he had been having a conversation with Seth Myers from oh, SNL. Is that for Seth? Yeah. And yeah. Seth is actually a very good friend of mine. He was actually oh, the geez. best man oh, at my wedding. He was? Seth was the best man at my wedding. Mm. So mm. I hadn't talked to Seth in a long time. So I, I texted him. I was like, hey, can you talk about this thing Simmons and I are talking about? And he was like, I can't. I'm out to dinner with Amy Poehler. Look at me, Mike. So I was like, well, just let's just FaceTime. Let's just all FaceTime right now because I haven't talked to Amy in a long time. Amy and I used to work together at Parks and Recreation. <laughs> Uh, so they so they FaceTimed us. So it was me and Bill Simmons and Amy Poehler and Seth Myers were all FaceTiming. And Amy, I was like, Amy, do you know Bill? And she was like, I don't think so, but they're from the same neighborhood in Boston. And he was like, oh, you're from Lexington? And she was like, no, I can't remember where she's from. And he was like, oh, you're thinking of John Krasinski. I also used to work with John Krasinski at the office. Look at me, and so they were kind of catching up and they were talking about Boston. We were all talking about Boston. And then into Simmons' house walked Mike O'Malley, the writer and actor Mike O'Malley. Oh, sure. Ooh, from Guts? From yeah. Guts. And, and Mike and I are old friends too because what? he was actually on an episode of Parks and Recreation that I wrote a long time ago. Look at me, Lou. Do, 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 do you have it? Yes. Yes. 
So we were we were all talking about this, and uh, and then we we realized that what the, what's really going on here, essentially, is that these sports leagues have just decided that you know, like the, like Live Golf, that they just don't care about the consumer anymore. And I was like, I mean, I, can't, I they're not wrong to. I can't remember the last time I watched golf, and then I remembered the last time I had watched any golf at all. Uh, I was watching a golf match here in Los Angeles uh, with Steve Carell from Parks and Rec, from the Office. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I can't remember who else was there. I want to I say John Krasinski was actually there too. But the point is, is that we hadn't, uh, I just hadn't watched golf in a long time. And that's why uh, something like Live Golf can get away with what they're getting away with. <laughs> Woody, how'd I do? Was there a story? Or- how'd I do, Woody? Wait, that was a, that was eleven. Master look at me, class. Louis. Yeah, That's yeah. a record. So I, 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 that is an all-time record. We gotta give him the fanfare for that all-time record for looking at me. Go, yes. Well done. I Thank you a- so much. Um, I I wish I had an actual trophy to hold, uh, but for now I'll just use, I'll just hold this Emmy. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. Look at me, Wow. No, hold on. Sorry. It's too big. I'm going to hold this Peabody Award that I won instead. <laughs> um, <laughs> kind of underwhelming award. Thank you, Levitard Show. Thanks to Amin Al Hassan for inventing the term, look at me, Louie. Um, I think accidentally, like he was maybe trying to say looky Lou and then by accident made up a term that we all use. <laughs> anyway, thanks to him, of course. Thanks to all the legends of the look at me, Louie game, the guys I grew up watching and idolizing <laughs> for their ability to always make it all about them. J.J. Watt. John Harbaugh, Aaron Rodgers, Monty Williams, Elon Musk, Salt Bay, Nick Saban, everyone who's ever hosted a Drive Time Boston area sports talk radio show, uh, LeBron, The Rock, uh, most Major League Baseball umpires, all NBA referees, uh, anybody who posts a picture on Twitter when a celebrity dies just to prove that they knew the celebrity, uh, Ooh, and uh, of course, and of course, uh, Darren Rovell is a good one, and of course, Chris <laughs> Whittingham. Thank you. I, I'm so proud to hold the all-time Levitard show record for most Look at Me Louis in one segment. Thank you. Way to go. Way to go. Very good. Very good. Congratulations. Mike, I have a follow-up. You said Seth Meyers was your best man. Do you have like a real-life best friend that was offended you chose your celebrity <laughs> best friend? <laughs> now I'm going to get Look at Me Louis for real. Do it. It's not going to be a bit anymore. I want the entire um, wedding party. I mean... You well, had to have like your uh, friend that was like you know you went, grew up went to with college them. together yeah. or high yeah. school or something, and you, you chose your celebrity best. Did friend. you ask Maybe Regis Dave. for your wife's hand? Uh, I did. Regis, yes, I did. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you. Look at me, Louis. Who got look at me, Louis? There, Cody. No, uh, me. You. You for I asking for Regis him. Philbin's yeah, you. hand. Yeah, Regis. Right. Yeah. Of course. Well, he didn't ask for Regis Philbin's <laughs> hand. <laughs> Oh, you never asked. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's actually not far off from good, what huh? happened. <laughs> so who was a real uh, friend that was offended? No one was offended. I, I asked Seth. I was Seth and I had gotten very close. And I, I'm so now Do you have I think normal I'm going to get friends? him for real. Do you have real friends? Like like normal? <laughs> I do. I guess okay. I have People real friends. People have never heard of them. <laughs> but I, uh, like Bill, I, I, mean. <laughs> I thought that giving a speech at the wedding was going to be a, a tricky thing to do. And I thought that Seth would be more comfortable doing it than maybe some So your real so friends yes. are boring. So yeah. yes, you did have a friend. <laughs> Yeah. They're not as talented. I, my my best man selection. I went to keep things simple. I went with a brother in law, but I have two brother in laws, and it came down to who I trusted more with the speech. Yeah, so the older right. brother got it. Right. So, so you're basically That's saying the that the the people who attended your wedding needed to be wowed by the speech, and Great so you order. went for Seth Meyers. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is mm. the person who gave the speech was going to be in a certain kind of spotlight that I thought he would handle very well. And also, we were legitimately very close friends. We had been working together for a long time, and and it made sense. Who was at your God, wedding? Get off my back. Who at your wedding <laughs> in the audience were you trying to impress with Seth? Like, who were you trying to impress with the I guest list? I wasn't trying list? to impress anybody, Billy. It wasn't about impressing Lauren people. Was there. It, was, who were it was merely, it was merely thinking about who would uh, deal with the pressure the best of anyone. And I thought that that. What was his opener? Was Seth. Why was there so much pressure on this? 
Because uh, your because celebrity of who was see, there. See, because now, of listen, the attendees. So here's listen. Here's what's going on right now. That I I texted Witty last night. It was like, hey, I have a dumb bit I want to do on the show. I want to see how many times I can get look at me, Louied, <laughs> and then claim that I set an all time Levitard show record. Now we're here because of the dumb bit. You're trapping me into getting look at me, Louied, for real. I'm not going to fall yeah. for it. Well, I'm not going to answer. You're this the question. one that said that. It sounds were, like you wanted to show off your trophies. The, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Who are the you're, groomsmen? Well, Just like you're help the one us that out. said. You're the one that said that you. Base your best man selection because of the pressure associated with, and that because leads to an obvious. Because of the guests obvious, at the wedding, hurt, not not necessarily guests, our hurt guests. Kyle's feelings. What? Because of the guests. Some list. of our guests, some of our guests, and some of my my in laws guests were people of note. Yeah. Oh, who attended the wedding? To. Top five. Yeah, 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 top five people who attended yeah, your wedding. Five. Can you do that, please? People yeah. of note. Please. Top people five people of note. Who yeah, yeah, yeah. was the, the, the least favorite person at oh, your the wedding? Oh, the OLI is going to be controversial. Sure in a different world than we do. Kyle okay? can't give a speech and impress Kathy Lee Griffin. The crappiest celebrity is a funny question. I think actually. No, it puts them in a terrible spot. Yeah, you can't do that. That's why it's good. Who was the crappiest celebrity? No, don't ask him like that. You got to be smart about it. Like, who was in the fewest amount of SNL sketches or something like that? That attended your wedding. Oh, you can't go crap. Yeah, give me a second. He's Phil putting together a top five. Hold on. He is putting together a top. I don't know which top five he's putting together. Do you, think, do you think Reed? Do you think Reed? Do you think Reed makes the top five? I do Not, think, no chance. No, no chance. But you can't no use chance. you can't use your father in law. Yeah. What year did you get married? Just so we have a frame of reference. Uh, two thousand five. Mm. Mm. Had to be when Seth Meyers was famous. So. This is like kind of this is, that was sort of like transition times. That was kind of like we were moving into the uh, in 2005. Jimmy Fallon was having a moment. Did yeah. Seth charge yeah. you yeah. like a fee? Mm. No, yeah, it was just like for, a small fee. A, did he ask you follow ups like what's yeah. your last like name? An appear, like an appearance fee. Did he have to get like, like a, a suit tailored at Men's Warehouse or something like that? <laughs> what famous band performed at your wedding? Why would he have to get a suit tailored at Men's Warehouse? It's like that same thing. You, you, you're in a bridal party <laughs> and you got to you got to go to a warehouse. Men's Warehouse and you got to. He's gotta, Seth. He's Mario. right. You got to show up. Taken, he's you not know? you. He has never stepped foot in a Men's Warehouse. Did he walk in as warehouse. a customer? But did he leave as a friend? Did he like the way he looked? It's guaranteed. It's guaranteed. I guarantee it. <laughs> Jinx. You He's can't, putting together he, a I'm going to say five. right now, you cannot use Regis. Mike, Men's Warehouse is kind of like an affordable suit place for us normies. Poor yeah. Kyle, man. Yeah. All right. He probably had a you lot don't of good have, You don't have a, an old Italian man who just comes to your house and tailor makes you suits like I do? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how good the guest list had to be that it's taking them this long to put together a top five? I mean, this is this is best celebrities or worst celebrities at your wedding? He's doing best. I'm going okay, to also I want worse. ask a follow-up list, so start having your mind. Best celebrity, but with worst gift. All right? So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, Most wait. famous uh, celebrity hold, that provided I, the right. worst. The, like, so did, the bottom five gifts from celebrities wait, at your wedding. Did Seth Meyers give a gift, or was his gift the speech that he made? Like, did he give you a gift? Or I believe he also, as per tradition, gave us a wedding gift. Uh, let me, let me, let yeah, me suggest something to you right what now. What was it? Gift card? Instead of doing something very tacky, <laughs> where I name oh. celebrities who were at my wedding, can I instead tell you a fairly incredible story about no. a particular wedding gift that I got from a particular person who attended the wedding, and I will promise you in advance it's worth your time. All right, tell us the story I, first, I, and I, then we'll see. I know, okay? I know the story. It's a good one. Yeah, I have to go get. Uh, let me give me thirty <laughs> seconds to go get this object. Yes. So and we're, then I will tell you the story. we're exchanging this for the list. It's a, yes, it's, but I promise you, it's worth it. it, it it's a good you. story. I okay. pray. I, there's no bid. I promise you, it's worth it. it give me it, ten yeah. seconds to go get this. It All will right. shock you. There was someone that attended his wedding that will shock you. Yeah, given but, given what you know about Mike Sure. But how do you feel about this exchange? Because we Trump? were about to get the the top five. There's 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 a payoff here. The, not just the person, but the gift. Okay. The gift is so on brand. So since you know you would rather have this story it's to a the great audience. Story. Okay. It's a great story. Okay. <laughs> it's a fantastic story. Okay, here we go. Right. 2005. The story was ruined. We already know the answer. Yeah, we no, know. New York City. I heard. I heard. I was still listening. Airbus. So a, a good <laughs> friend of my, a, a good friend of my in-laws at the time was a New York real estate mogul named Donald Trump. Uh, he later <laughs> would go on to be the president of the United we'll States. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> we get in the mail, my wife and I. <laughs> A giant box from 
the Trumps that said, and we're like, oh my God, this is the wedding gift. Like, this is amazing. What did Donald Trump get us <laughs> for a wedding gift? And we pull it out and I'll show it to you. Oh my God. <laughs> it's this vase. <laughs> wow. <laughs> But wait, there's more. <laughs> I believe it is the ugliest object I've ever seen. It's certainly the ugliest it's object expensive, I though. own. Um, but I believe that it's the ugliest object I've ever seen in any medium. So we're like, okay, what is this story here, right? Like, did he, <laughs> like, he, he didn't go to a store and buy this. Like, he didn't even have his assistant go you buy this. You didn't register like, how, for that. No, we didn't <laughs> register for this boss. So we're trying to theorize. And there's no note. There's no piece of paper that says, like, here's what this is or anything. So I'm like, what is the story here? I formulate a theory. The theory that I formulate is that it is overflow decoration from one of his casinos. Like, he bought... 5,000 identical $12 vases to go into like the, the Atlantic City Casino. And I was like, right, like imagine you're walking down a, a hotel corridor in a, in a casino, cheap casino hotel, and there's like stanchions all along the walls, right? And like every 10 feet, there's like a vase like the, uh, that looks fake, fake fancy, right? Maybe I'll bet that's what this fancy. is. And it, as I'm formulating that theory, I look at, and I turn it around and look at the back. There's nothing on the back. <laughs> <laughs> that so was clearly, the wall. it's designed to just face out like this. And he's so cheap that they didn't even, he was like, no, oh, don't paint the back. The back's going to face the wall of the casino. <laughs> Told Not you amazing. it was worth it. That's I mean, amazing. look how ugly, look it. how yeah. Diabolically ugly this object is. I'm, just sure ugly. I'm sure now we've told this story on air now, but I feel like if you had sold this during the height of Trump's presidency, you could have gotten a lot of money. Could have done from a lot of, of good for that. I I had a plan to go on Seth's show because he was there and he knows the story, and auction it off and give all of the money to. <laughs> Either a charity that was fighting something he was doing, or just his opponent. Like or just Joe, make a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Joe Biden. I was like, campaign. whatever. You, and then you you own this thing. You can smash it with a sledgehammer. You can throw it off a building. Do whatever you want. Oh, next and month. Then the, and, well, then the pandemic hit. The pandemic hit, and I was and I was thwarted. But yeah, maybe I'll, if he runs again, maybe I'll still do that. Yeah, next Moss, Miami. We we destroy the Vaz. I mean. <laughs> Fantastic. Or just oh smash God. it right now. That could will kill on social. Oh, yeah. Do that right now. Just stand up and spike it right now. Come on. No, I want it to, if I the destroy Bills, it, which, which I want to do, I want it to be, for, I want it to raise money for something. Ron McGill's Wildlife go. Conservation Fund. <laughs> Take out the bills right before, yeah. Do yeah, that. that's, it's what Donald yeah. would have wanted. Yeah, say, say that Ralph Wilson Stadium should have a dome over it before you do it. Yeah. <laughs> you really get the socials. Can I somehow still pry the list out yeah, of you? Yeah, I'd please. Like the list. <laughs> yeah. You started working on the list, so just give us what you had already worked on. Right. No, I'll just say that number one is that Tony Bennett sang Fly Me to the Moon. Oh, wow. Jesus Christ. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Nice. Yeah. Reed got that done for you, huh? He did indeed. <laughs> He's a friend. <laughs> All right, let's get your side of the day. Start of the day. So awesome. Start of the day. It is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. The stat of the day is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Folks, very few professional basketball players make it to a 20th season. According to StatMuse, the most points per game in a 20th season. Robert Parrish had 3.9 points per game. The Chief. Vince Carter had 5.4. Insanity. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, 10.1. Luel Cinder. <laughs> oh my god. His nickname? <laughs> Cap. Captain. Dirk Nowitzki had 12 exactly points per game in his 20th season. And with a whopping 17.6 points per game, an unbelievable figure in his 20th season, the late great Kobe Bryant. 
Oh, sorry, my bad. He's not in first place. He's in second place. In first is LeBron James, who's averaging 27, <laughs> eight and a half, and six and a half. In his 20th season, 27 points per game. Mike, thank you so much for that story. Really, the set of the day paled in comparison, but we finally got the uh, we finally got the the Trump vase. We, we've we've got one more question about your wedding before you go, though. Hey, Mike, it's Tony. Listen, a uh, quick question for you. 2005, I put that basically in the heart of one of the best times in reggaeton history. Do you guys have any reggaeton at the uh, at the wedding or no? Gasolina, uh, Zion Atlantic. Say that we did. Kid. We had a listen. No we had a way. band. I think there was some at the at the uh, rehearsal dinner party the night before. But we had a we had a band. We didn't have a DJ, so I think it was more like uh, yeah, Tony Bennett. It was more like <laughs> hey, yeah, and it was more like Outcast and and stuff like that than reggaeton. But uh, I got white guys for talking about Outcast. How many times did you play Hey Ya? I didn't play anything. You did the, the dance, band played you? it. You were on the dance How many floor, times did you shake it like a Polaroid exactly. picture? Yeah. Did you just say hey ya for us? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that's fair. I'm going to say it right now, and I think that's fair. Was Gelman there? If I had said we had, uh, pa- like, Paul Anka instead of <laughs> reggaeton, fine. Mm. But Outcast, Come on. Was Gelman there? Gelman was there. Of course he was. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he's family. Wow. I mean, come on. Is it a good gift from Gelman? <laughs> I don't remember offhand, but I believe it was. Um, uh, Kelly Ripa was there too. It's a trip too. to Morocco. We had the whole we had the whole show. How much money did you make? I mean, <laughs> off the wedding? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Everybody knows gifts. the best part of the wedding is just sitting back counting the envelopes. Oh, oh, yeah, it's the best. Right it. at yeah. the end, yeah. Just. I don't think we made a dollar. I don't think anybody gave us money. Wow. I mean, no why cards? would anyone give us money? Classic rich when, people. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So why would yeah. anybody give you a vase from their casino? Right. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> All right, Mike. Happy holidays. Thank you so much. Hey, for is this your us. last show of the of 2022? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What? Yep. Yeah. You so went we, out with a bang. You Mike. went out with yeah. probably it's certainly a, a Suey nominee for story. If you got married uh, like this upcoming year, who from the show is getting invited? Yeah. Mm. Just Dan. Oh, great question. It's just Dan. Well, how many people attended your wedding? I, I guess it would depend on, the, uh, uh, depend on how the size of the wedding. Yeah, how many people know? went to yours? Witty like is looking plus? into that screen like he feels he should be invited. <laughs> he does. <laughs> it was like two. It was like two twenty, or something. Well, that's not I mean, big. honestly, there would be fewer folks probably invited by uh, by our parents and my my in laws and stuff. So there'd be more room. I'm gonna say the whole shipping container can come. Yes, everybody, ah, yeah. you guys are all, all right. Yeah. If all I right, if so. I get married again this year, yeah. you guys, <laughs> the old, the old of the vows, you know? yeah. you're from Hollywood. <laughs> you got three weeks. Get on it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for hosting Tony's MMA hangout. By the way, live from your wedding, we're gonna appreciate that, especially Juju. <laughs> all right, happy holidays, Mike. Happy holidays, everybody. Thanks, Mike. Mike Schur's marathon observations. Uh, well, I mean, I've been watching the marathon. Uh, I've made some observations. Oh, wow. I guess you could call it marathon observations. Yes. Does that make, does that sound good? Yeah, sounds uh, great. You've got marathon observations. All right. I've got some marathon observations. It is time for Mike Schur to share his game notes. <laughs> no one in the media will tell you what happened better than my boys do. Marathon observations is sponsored by no one. Because it's 7 in the morning on the West Coast. <laughs> You've been live for 22 hours, and no one is listening anymore. <laughs> Dan! <laughs> After decades at ESPN, multiple suspensions for various shenanigans, public battles over China, and LeBron James billboards, the firing of Chris Cody, the rehiring of Chris Cody, and one very awkward interview with Rob Manfred. <laughs> Make no mistake about it. The Dan Lebetard show with Stu Gotts is back. The pirate ship. The best thing that ever happened for fans of this show is not DraftKings giving you $50 million to do whatever you want. Nor is it 
you giving us 24 straight hours of content that we didn't want. <laughs> the best thing that ever happened for fans of this show is the Florida Panthers losing in the first round <laughs> of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Right, yeah. So we don't have to hear 10 more hours so right. of Mike and Roy <laughs> talking about Sergei Bobrovsky <laughs> and Coach Q. The Ice Cats. Bob. Wait. I take that back. The best thing that ever happened for fans of this show was the Miami Heat getting swept in the first round of the playoffs. So we do get to hear 10 more hours of you realizing you could have had James Harden for Tyler Hero. You know what the first R in Hero stands for, Dan? I do not. Rut row. <laughs> you know what the second R in Hero stands for, Dan? I do not. Regret. <laughs> because you could have traded him for James Harden. You know what the O, E, and R in Hero stand for, Dan? I do not. Overrated. Yes, of course. I should have you know what the H in Harden stands for, Dan? I do not. Hero. As in you could have had him for Tyler Hero. Hey, Dan. You know what the difference is between the Miami Heat and the Boston Celtics? I do not. The Celtics won a playoff game this year. Dan Levitard telling me that Boston is racist in retaliation for these heat jokes. Collision course. I spent four hours in the shipping container in 2018 while writing a piece about this show for Slate.com. It didn't smell great then. <laughs> I can only imagine what it smells like now after 22 hours of you packed in there like sardines. My guess is that it smells like sardines. Chris Whittingham, a non-Caucasian guy who loves advanced metrics and soccer and uses words like chicanery and call zero nil. And every time he says something fancy, a little jingle plays that makes fun of how fancy he is. Somewhere, Pablo Torre is jealous. So jealous. Witty. So jealous. Jessica Smetana, a football-obsessed woman who leaks confidence when she talks and is unfairly asked to answer on behalf of all women every time something happens involving women in sports because none of the dopes in that room know how to talk about misogyny without putting their feet in their mouth. Somewhere, Mina Kimes is relieved. Smeddy. Yesterday at noon, I wrote a joke for this bit. And the joke was that this 24-hour marathon would be the longest Dan has ever gone without drinking tequila since the first 10 years of his life. Then I turned on the marathon eight hours in and saw Dan and Charles Barkley drinking tequila. Dan-o. Here's my review of the guests I've seen so far. Ron McGill, great as always. Jim Rome, take it down a notch. <laughs> Jamel Hill, casually drops that Skipper gave her her first million dollar check. Legend. Pat Riley, pretty chill. Like, really chill. Like, maybe he somehow got into Stugatz's stash right before the Zoom started. I'm pretty sure, at one point... Pat Riley called Amin El Hassan Amino Acid. Yes, he did. <laughs> he did, right? Yes, that is absolutely correct. And also showed us a UFO. Showed yeah. us an actual UFO. Shane Battier. You know how Shane Battier is aging, Dano? <laughs> Not at all. Like a fine wine. Yes. But the best guest by far. The deer behind Michelle Beadle. <laughs> John Skipper should sign those deer to a multi-year contract 
and have them just roam around the Cleveland earth. <laughs> I saw the official poster for this marathon. Mike Shore on the poster. Adnan Verk on the poster. Brockmeyer, a fictional character on the poster. David Sampson, not on the poster. Miami finally gets its revenge for that god-awful stadium that built the city out of a billion dollars. You know what the S in Samson stands for, Dano? Uh, I swindler. Super pissy that he's not on the poster. Fountain of content. More like fountain of being super pissy that he's not on the poster. If you don't like this marathon, might I recommend you flip over to ESPN, where every day they do an accidental marathon featuring 24 straight hours of New York Jets coverage <laughs> with Mike Greenberg. <laughs> this marathon started 20 hours ago with Dan crying and Stu Gatz carrying a feather duster <laughs> and Billy holding a seven-day-old baby and the only woman in the entire studio being forced to stand up and Stu Gatz sitting in his chair shirtless and Chris Cody sitting in a pool full of goo and Mike Ryan covering a Verizon live read that Dan couldn't do because he was crying and a mean and poppy on the roof and a fake pirate ship and all that was in the first 30 minutes and you're still going DraftKings didn't bail right then and there the hell are they thinking <laughs> speaking of hell Art Bryles Dan those are the marathon observations that is go, I mean professionally done I'll still be talking about the Panthers though Mike yeah, I'll still be talking about the Panthers thank you very much Poor man's Honors. Bill Lawrence, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> there he is. Thank you for being on with us. Mike Sure, you are the best, sir.